this learning adventure that the art and science of public health is multidisciplinary in nature, very complex and broad, and continuously evolving over time. In this specific mini lecture, we shall examine what exactly is health promotion and the five levels of prevention. So let's begin by examining this concept and defining it. Well, health promotion is a process of enabling people to increase control over and to improve their overall health and well-being. This not only embraces actions directed at strengthening the skills and capacities of individuals, but also action directed towards changing various social, environmental, political, and economic conditions so as to alleviate their impact on public and individual health. The health promotion movement of the 21st century uh, really has the possibility of reinventing itself by offering holistic definitions of health that encompass the mind, the body, the spirit, cultural and political, economic and environmental components. H hence, the health promotion movement goes far beyond access to acute episodic types of health care often provided in hospitals and includes a broad spectrum of social, political, cultural, and economic determinants of health. We shall examine the 15 social determinants of health in more detail in a subsequent mini lecture. The Ottawa Charter for Health Promotion has identified five key strategies. And the first is to build healthy public policies. We want to create supportive environments, strengthen community action, develop personal skills, and reorientate health services. The Ottawa Charter Health Promotion also notes that health is created in the context of everyday life. And this includes where people live, love, work, and play. This is a very critical point because the Charter acknowledges that health occurs within the context and situation of the environment in which we live. As opposed to healthcare systems or acute care facilities such as hospitals per se. There are three big priority areas that have been identified by the Ottawa Charter. The first one includes uh, reducing inequalities in wealth and income distribution. Indeed, a substantial body of research has shown that individuals with lower social and economic status, or SES, have poor health outcomes. And these include increased morbidity and mortality measures in comparison to those with higher social economic status. Priority area number two involve strengthening communities by building alliances to improve unhealthy living conditions. In fact, there is a growing global recognition that health is not only influenced by one's biology or genetic makeup, but is also greatly impacted by a variety of determinants of health, including the environment, where one lives, loves, works, and plays, of course. And poverty is a major social determinant of health. Extreme poverty is here's the, here defined as those individuals who have to reside on less than $1.75 Canadian per day. That's about the cost of a cup of coffee. Think about it. Could you survive on less than $1.75 per day? And that includes all the costs for transportation, clothing, water, energy, medications that you may have to take, and housing and other associated costs. We really have to rethink how we use and design our environments to promote health. And this includes how we design our cities and communities in which we reside in. 
For example, is the city you live in bike friendly to promote physical fitness and exercise? What is prevention? Well, when you take a look at this photo I took, you can see a young man holding an umbrella. The purpose of this technology, if you wish, is to keep rain from falling onto that young man. It may also be used by him to shield him from harmful UV rays of the sun. Hence the word prevention is often equated with averting something from taking place or protecting us from potential harm. Now let's examine this concept in more detail from a public health perspective. Let's define prevention. First, prevention consists of actions, measures, interventions, programs, policies, and or legislation which seek to avert the development or progression of disease or possible harm, also injury, disability, or death, and to improve, maintain, or and or restore health-related quality of life across the entire lifespan. The scope and levels of prevention in public health have slowly evolved over the past century, and there are currently five levels of prevention, primordial, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary levels of prevention. Initially, prevention from the public health context was only influenced by the mechanistic medical model of health. Therefore, prevention activities focus on disease or pathological states only. However, our knowledge and understanding of health has expanded greatly over the past century and, show, and so has the associated levels as well. And primordial prevention consists of conditions, actions, and measures that seek to minimize hazards to health and that inhibit the emergence and establishment of processes and factors known to increase disease, alterations to health, injury, and or death. So here's an example of primordial prevention. Mandatory seatbelt legislation and infant car seats help to decrease the incidence of serious motor-related injuries and or death. In fact, cars built prior to the 1960s uh, didn't even have seatbelts in North America. We see the introduction of mandatory uh, seatbelts as a form of primordial prevention in North America during the late 1970s and 1980s, which helped to decrease fatal motor vehicle accidents by approximately 50%, although the number of cars increased exponentially on the road as well. We currently know in Canada that every single dollar we spend on uh, road safety related issues, there is a return of, an, of investment of $40 or 3,900%. So you can see the impact of this form of prevention can be quite dramatic. So what is primary prevention? Well, primary prevention consists of preventative approaches and interventions that seek to avert the occurrence of alterations to health and to prevent disease, injury, or disabilities from taking place. So here we have an immunization example. Every dollar we spend in Canada on immunization results in a $16 saving for associated health care costs or a return on investment of 1,500%, which is quite a dramatic. So prevention, an ounce of prevention, of course, is worth a pound of cure. That's one of the things that are often associated with vaccination programs in, in, in the public health context. Immunization against various vaccine-preventable communicable diseases, including smallpox, polio, tuberculosis, measles, mumps, and rubella, uh, have been shown on a global scale to be an efficient and cost-effective 
public health intervention. Other examples include school-based health promotion programs, which encourage children to be more active in exercise and to make healthy food choices. So what is secondary prevention? Well, secondary prevention consists of activities that are aimed at early detection, diagnosis, and treatment of a condition, disease, or altered state of health, and consists of interventions which seek to stop or reverse further processes associated with this altered state of health. It also involves advocacy for accessible diagnostic and treatment services for vulnerable populations, such as the elderly, indigenous peoples, and of course, homeless. So screening for hypertension is an example here of secondary prevention. High blood pressure or hypertension has been dubbed the silent killer because clients don't actually realize they, they are hypertensive in nature because there are no overt signs and symptoms. The only way that you can detect hypertension is through screening by taking one's blood pressure. And if, the, a high, if an individual has high blood pressure and it remains undiagnosed or uncontrolled, it can cause various complications, including aneurysms, chronic kidney disease, it can damage your eyes, uh, lead to heart attacks and heart failure, peripheral artery disease, stroke, and vascular dementia, to name but a few complications. What is tertiary prevention? Well, tertiary prevention consists of activities that are aimed at preventing further uh, deterioration or progress of an altered state of health or condition. So providing exercise and physiotherapy to a client recovering from a stroke would be example of, ter of, of this form of, uh, of prevention, tertiary prevention. Other examples uh, include things like providing health ed education, related to home-based monitoring of glucose levels and insulin administration for individuals with diabetes, uh, administering direct observed therapy or DOT, D-O-T, for prescribed medications for a client with tuberculosis by a public health nurse uh, to reduce the risk of developing drug-resistant tuberculosis, which could place family members, co-workers, or the community at large at risk. All right, so what is quaternary prevention? Well, this last form of prevention, or last level of prevention, consists of a group of actions and measures which seek to prevent, monitor, decrease, and or alleviate possible harm or adverse effects, aka iatrogenic effects, caused by healthcare interventions themselves various treatments a client may undergo, unnecessary diagnostic procedures, for example, medications and or programs they may be involved in. So here's an example. Hospital acquired infections. They can be caused by a variety of infectious agents, including viral, bacterial, and fungal pathogens. The most common types encountered are bloodstream infections, from intravenous lines, for example, pneumonia uh, associated with ventilator use, urinary tract infections, very, very common, and of course, surgical site infections. In this particular photo here that I took, you can see a client in a hospital who has developed, unfortunately, bacterial cellulitis of the left leg. Both hospital-acquired infections, or HIAs, and community-acquired infections are a growing public health concern globally due to microbial antibiotic resistance. In fact, not only are antimicrobial resistance pathogens increasing in number, they are expanding their geographical ranges. For example, Staph aureus is a very, very common um, type, uh, very common hospital-acquired infection and community-acquired infection as well. 
Medicillin-resistant Staph aureus, or MRSA for short, was first recognized way back in 1961. And ironically, it was recognized just shortly after it came onto market. By the year 2000, um, approximately half of all nosocomial Staph aureus isolated infections in North America were medicillin resistant. So microbial antibiotic resistance is a growing and major public health concern globally because we are simply running out of antibiotics to treat once common bacterial infections. I wanted to talk a little bit more from the, at least from the Canadian context to provide as an example for unnecessary medical tests and procedures. In Canada, more than one million potentially unnecessary medical tests and procedures are performed each year. This is really a staggering statistic if you think about it. For example, in the provinces of Ontario, Saskatchewan, and Alberta alone, 18 to 35 percent of all clients undergoing low-risk surgeries, these are very, very minor low-risk surgeries, had unnecessary tests performed. These include such things as unnecessary chest x-rays, electrocardiograms, and or cardiac stress tests. Here's an additional reading which reinforces various concepts uh, that we have talked about in this mini lecture series related to health promotion and the five levels of prevention. Well, that's all folks. Thank you for listening to this uh, lecture and I hope that you will listen to other lectures in this mini lecture series related to the art and science of public health. Cheers! <laughs>